Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, every year we try to organize a symposium like this, where we share some of our, uh, some of our, uh, yeah, our new interpretations, our discoveries, and our uh, general uh, excitement about the excavation project that we did at Palouris in Cyprus. I am Victor, Victor Klinkenberg, and I'm the field director of Palouris. Um, so I'm responsible for all the practical things usually at the, at the site. And right now I'm going to try to lead this symposium in a way that we can all uh, understand uh, what's going on. And uh, so if anything goes wrong, you can blame me. It's very easy. Um, so, um, uh, especially for um, if you have any questions during the symposium for any of the speakers, then uh, you're more, you have more than enough uh, time and, and, and room for, for that. But please keep it until after each presentation. Um, uh, and uh, we also will have some extra time at the very end after the last uh, lecture to ask any questions about the presentations, but also generally about the project or even if you have uh, questions about archaeology in general, we don't care, we're here to have fun. Um, so, uh, to give you a, a brief introduction into the site itself, Palouris is an excavation project and it's a joint operation by the University of Leiden from the Netherlands and the University of Cyprus. Uh, we've been working since 2015 uh, almost every year we've returned to excavate at Palouris, and the site is located very near the coast, near Paphos, and on the map on the uh, top left, you can see approximately where the site is. Um, the excavation site is around nine hectares in size, so it's really a large area where we can find archaeological materials, um, but there's only two fields where we work usually. It's a, a, a settlement from a village from the Chalcolithic period, um, which is also known as the Copper Age, and this is around 3000 BC. So I usually tell people when they are visiting Palouris that it's 5000 year old, everything that you, uh, that you see. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we have two fields that we work on, and this is an aerial view of uh, the site. And you see indicated the upper plot and the lower plot. Um, these two fields have been acquired by the government of Cyprus and are now national monuments. And it means that we can continue working here without the fear of having villas built on top of it. So that's really amazing. Um, sometimes we call the upper plot the upstairs, and then we talk about the downstairs and the lower plot when we feel uh, uh, like we need to uh, have some hierarchy. Um, but uh, uh, the, the real uh, difference between the two plots is that the the upper one is where we started in 2015, and the lower plot is where we uh, continued, uh, where we started only about three years ago, and now we're working on both. Um, with a white outline, you can see the trenches we have dug, and these are about five by 10 meters, uh, rectangular uh, trenches. And <clears throat> inside these trenches, we find the remains of this settlement. Um, so this is a typical example that you may have seen on the poster that advertised tonight's event. Um, here you see some walls or the bases of walls of buildings from this period. Um, so on top of these uh, round uh, circular structures, uh, there would have been uh, higher walls made of mud and then a flat roof that would have been the typical building from the period. And most of these were used as houses, as domestic structures. So here we have uh, a modern uh, reconstruction of one of these houses based on the archaeological evidence. And this is in Lemba, very close to our uh, site. So this is what you should imagine, kind of what one of those buildings uh, looked like and where people lived in, where they cooked their dinner, uh, where they slept, uh, etc. Inside the houses and outside, in, our, in the soil layers that we are digging, we find all sorts of artifacts. And amongst those, we find beautiful pottery with this red color. Uh, sometimes when we're very lucky, we find these really cute stone figurines. Um, and since a couple of years, we are focusing uh, a lot on trying to find organic remains. So botanical remains, for instance. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about um, today, is these uh, categories. Bleda During will start. He is the director of the project and he's been looking into these uh, cute figurines from the period and he's going to offer us 
uh, a new interpretation, which is a bit, uh, I think, a bit more fun than, than earlier ones. So uh, that's what we're all about. Afterwards, uh, pottery will be the topic of discussion by Maria, who is our co-director uh, at uh, Palouris and the uh, uh, pottery expert. And then afterwards, Evi uh, Margaritis will uh, talk about the results of the botanical research, so the few botanical remains we have, um, which is really uh, quite exciting. A lot of the information that, that we're uh, getting tonight is completely new, even to us. Uh, we haven't heard everything yet, so uh, you're really getting everything hot off the presses. Uh, uh, that's uh, what the symposium is for, I guess. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my favorite find, which is uh, which was uh, uh, quite extensively described in the press already, uh, the Palurus poo. Um, so without uh, any uh, further ado, uh, there's, there's one little thing I would like to mention already for those of you who are not super familiar with the project. Uh, we have a website, palurus.eu, uh, a Facebook and an Instagram where we constantly are trying to keep people updated about what we're doing. And especially during the excavation season, we are very active in trying to show how it's going, what we're finding and uh, how much fun we're having. Uh, so if you're interested in the project, then you can find a lot of information on our website. And also there, you can find information about the foundation that we started, the Friends of Palouris, where people who are interested and passionate about the project uh, can register as a member and then uh, get a lot of extra information that um, most of the public don't get. Um, so uh, if you are very interested, please do uh, uh, check out our sites and our socials, and then uh, uh, you'll probably find everything uh, you like. So without uh, any uh, further ado, I would like to uh, open up the floor for Bleda for the first talk. Uh, the dancing dervishes of uh, of Calcolithic Cyprus. Uh, I would say uh, uh, the floor is all yours. Right. Can you see my PowerPoint? Absolutely. Great. So uh, it's a pleasure to talk here tonight. Uh, thank you, Victor, for the wonderful uh, introduction of the site. Uh, I uh, selected one of my uh, favorite uh, topics of all times, which is a fascinating uh, find cat category of the Calcolithic, the figurines and uh, uh, pendants these in uh, cruciform shapes. Hundreds of these have been found uh, in the Copper Age uh, Cyprus, all across the island. They range in size from 15 to 3 centimeters. Uh, they are often made of uh, picrolite, which is this uh, kind of soft rock that you can find in the Trodos Mountains. It can be green or black, or it comes in different varieties. Um, and occasionally you find the same cruciform figurines also made in, uh, in other materials. They are very schematic anthropo anthropomorphic figurines, so they represent humans. And they typically have these uh, bent knees with legs pressed together and outstretched arms, a long neck and a tilted head with schematic facial features. Um, and uh, every year we find some of these, let me see, can I? Yes, we find some of these uh, figurines also uh, at Palouris and that's always one of the most exciting things to, uh, to find. And uh, especially the, the black one on the top, which is the, um, the icon of the Friends of Palurus, was, uh, is a very beautiful object. But we also get other ones like this, uh, this, this uh, hat that we call the alien at the bottom. Um, but they're always amazing uh, finds. Um, these figurines are also quite popular, not just with me, but with the general public in, uh, in Cyprus and also beyond, I would say. Um, they resonate with uh, contemporary tastes uh, and they've become iconic in the articulation of Cypriot identities, Cypriot identities in the present. So they feature, for example, in Cypriot uh, Euro coinage, but they are also used in public buildings such as the Paphos Airport, which you see on this slide. Um, in popular culture, these figurines are often linked to the great mother goddess. A uh, sort of manifestation of the predecessor of Aphrodite uh, associated with fertility and childbirth. And here's a quote from the um, 
museum in uh, the Cycladic Museum in Athens, where they have a lot of these figurines, uh, where they say they may have been linked with the cult of the great mother goddess or with practices associated with childbirth. And they continue, it may not be a coincidence that the district of Paphos, where many of these figurines have been found, became in historical times the focus of worship of another fertility goddess, namely Aphrodite. So uh, in popular culture, there's a clear link between these figurines um, and uh, fertility and so on, and the great mother goddess. Um, one of the fascinating aspects of these figurines is that they're often shown wearing a smaller version of themselves in a necklace. And you can see that here on this uh, figurine in the middle. Um, so it's much like how people today would wear a cross. Now, we find a lot of these figurines and clearly they were significant to calculatic people, but it's the ways in which they were uh, important to these people that I find uh, fascinating. And I would like to say a few things about that today. Now, the dominant interpretation at present is that these figurines uh, are centered on female fertility and childbirth. This interpretation uh, with that cruciform figurines are best understood as uh, women giving birth is based on very interesting contextual evidence from the site of Kisodega Mosfilia, which is not very far from uh, Palouris, where a house model has been found with a series of associated figurines in clay, and some of which you see on this slide. And Diane Bolger and Elizabeth Goring um, looked at these figurines and dismissed the interpretation of cruciforms as representations of the great mother goddess, and instead argued that these figurines were closely associated with childbirth and depicted women in labor, and that these objects were used to instruct women about the birthing uh, process and to prepare them for what was to come. Uh, which is a fascinating interpretation, and um, there is uh, there is a lot going for it. Um, and after the emergence of this new interpretation of these clay figurines, this kind of idea has been extended to cruciform figurines as a whole. So all of these are now often seen as somehow representing childbirth. Um, but there, I think, I think there's a bit of a problem. So this clay figurine that you see here on the left might well represent a woman giving birth. There even might be a child actually emerging from her womb, uh, here depicted in black or painted in, in actually in reddish color, but it's a black and white photo. Um, yet it needs to be emphasized that this figurine is completely unique. Uh, in the fact that it's showing a, a possible child emerging and that it's part of a relatively small corpus of ceramic fig figurines seated on stools that might be linked to birthing. But these clay figurines differ in important respects from the cruciforms in picrolite. For example, they uh, have, uh, they have uh, outstretched legs, uh, so their legs are, are spread and they have clear indications of their gender. But the uh, cruciform pic uh, picolite figurines lack these things, so they rarely have uh, aspects that would indicate that they are female. Instead, they seem to be kind of neutral in sexual terms. They have no swollen stomach or breast that would indicate that they're pregnant, or even uh, pubic triangles. But I think the most crucial thing here is that the bodily posture of these picolite figurines is quite different from the clay figurines. So rather than having spread legs, which makes sense if you're giving birth, these legs are actually pressed together and they have bent knees, uh, which is a bit odd if you're trying to give birth, at least in my perspective. Of course, I haven't ever given birth myself, so I might be mistaken here. Um, so what may these figurines be doing? Um, I have an alternative suggestion, which I just published in a brief paper, and this is this kind of the, the short version of uh, that paper. So um, 
I, I use this title of uh, dervishes in, in, in this presentation, um, not to suggest, of course, that these picrolite figurines have anything to do with uh, the, the, the Sufi uh, dances that we can today enjoy in Anatolia, uh, but to argue that maybe this, this idea of uh, dancing and movement being important might also be something that works for these uh, picrolite figurines and that dancing might have been a crucial uh, activity in the calculated communities. And if we look at uh, the figurines that uh, are the topic of discussion, there are a number of aspects that might actually suggest that maybe these people, these figurines are actually engaged in dancing. We see outstretched arms and tilted heads, there are bent knees pressed together. And even in the smallest figurines and pendants of, cru of the cruciforms, there's often this effort to emphasize precisely these aspects. So the bent knees, the tilted heads. Um, so these were probably quite important uh, to calculatic people. Um, and further, if you sort of look at the less uh, standardized or the, 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 the sort of less typical examples of these cruciforms, there are other clues that might suggest that movement and dancing could have been important. important. So one aspect here is the figurines of the so-called salamiu type. These are picolite figurines where the arms form a secondary figure at right angles to the main figure. So you like the upper left corner where it says A, you see the main figure, but then there's another figure also with a hat and, and knees and, and feet at right angles. Um, so this almost looks like a rotating figure where you could actually swap the figure in around and it would still be the same composition. Um, so, and this could be clockwise or counterclockwise. And the same kind of idea of movement uh, can be seen in figurines that have their hands like that. So either left or right, uh, up and downwards. So you could see these as uh, figurines that represent uh, some kind of rotating movement. So left uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. But you could also say that they are actually holding hands with other figurines in a kind of procession of dancers. Um, and the same uh, indication of a rotating movement is found in other figurines, such as the ones that uh, here are uh, depicted under C, where there are a couple of examples of three figurines that actually merge at the center. And so again, we seem to be dealing with something that might be best understood as a kind of rotating or dancing uh, movement. Um, so I think for me, there's a lot of clues that suggest or point in the same uh, direction. And, uh, and this direction has a lot of links in uh, both uh, recent culture and the deep past. So this combination of bent knees and outstretched arms, tilted hats, the suggestions of rotating movements in some of the cruciforms suggest that we might be dealing with an activity um, that is actually best uh, understood as dancing. Um, it would even be possible in extension that we, if we have a necklace with a lot of these figurines strung in a row, that we're actually dealing with a group of dancers. And the idea that the uh, dancing and feasting was of central importance to prehistoric societies has actually been put forward uh, some decades ago in a, a book called Dancing at the Dawn of Civilization by Stephen uh, Garfinkel, who uh, that book has actually had a lot of support and I, nobody has really criticized it. And I think there's a lot to it. We also have uh, evidence from later periods in Cyprus. So here I've uh, selected one with three dancers and a, a person in the middle playing a symbol, I think, from, uh, from about 750 to 600 BCE. But uh, there are other examples of, of dancing uh, in, in later periods in, uh, in Cyprus as well. 
Um, and it's not a very strange idea. I think it's very hard to find society where dancing is not an important issue uh, and a way of coming together and celebrating feasts. So for me, the, the real puzzling question is uh, not whether these people are dancing, but why this uh, particular um, interpretation of figurines has not been put forward before. Thank you. Amazing, Leda. There's some uh, some time for questions if people are uh, have any doubts or criticisms or uh, <laughs> applause for uh, for Bleda's new uh, new ideas. I have these. <laughs> I, I I had a, 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 a an artist friend who took me to the roundhouses and he gave me these as gifts. And they are very, there is the dancing one. And and there is, I'm not quite sure what, what is what. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but they are very interesting figurines. Oh, and I yeah. think they were taken from the idea of what went before. Right. Yeah, they're lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they, they do seem to inspire uh, constantly uh, people in uh, both uh, in Buffalo's airport. There are lots of these uh, statues uh, outside, but at Larnaca, they, they have uh, a lot of interpretive uh, uh, paintings with figurines uh, as well to welcome everyone uh, to the island. So, but these uh, are unique. These are unique from us from somebody who does sculpture. Maybe. But unfortunately, he's Demise. But I yeah. keep them as a something special and it's good to see it related and i see where it's coming from now it all comes from feasting that's uh that's what i think <laughs> about uh, prehistoric habits all right if there are no <laughs> questions i would like to give the floor to uh maria oh you do uh, Azra. uh it's actually i have the i have oh. the question um the motif of the figurines wearing themselves. How does that figure into the dancing interpretation? Yeah, that, that is a good question. So I, I think that the idea of dancing is, uh, is an important trope in itself. And by wearing a dancer, you would kind of indicate that you are somebody that uh, that approves of communal feasting and that sort of thing. That that could be one way of interpreting, interpreting that. But uh, I, I'm not sure that would convince the community at large, though, so, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I this... do find it quite interesting as well. Sorry, because <laughs> oh. the, the birthing figurine also is wearing a version of this dancing yeah, figurine. That's right. Yeah. Too. That's so right. it's like a maybe, maybe it is like a marker of where somebody belongs. Who they dance with? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah there's more this variety. Is necklace, I guess. This is the necklace I was given. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a tight schedule. I'll, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Maria. Um, Maria has Hi. been uh, with us since 2016, I think. Yes. Uh, first as a as a student and uh, gradually uh, worked her way up. She's uh, currently finishing mm -hmm. her PhD at Leiden University. Um, she's our pottery specialist at uh, at the site where she processes all the bucket loads of pottery that we uh, excavate. Um, and uh, she is now a co-director of uh, of our excavation. And she's going to tell us something about local exchange networks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me uh, share the screen and let's see if this would work. Does it work? Not full screen yet, but uh, no. There you go. There Absolutely go. beautiful. <laughs> okay, because it looks like a micromorphology sample is what you mean. Uh, 
Okay, well, hi, I'm Maria. I guess I will not introduce myself because Victor has done that already. I will go straight into talking to you about um, pottery and ceramic petrography at Palures. Um, so as Victor said, we get buckets and buckets of pottery at Palures each day, um, quite a lot. If anyone is interested in working with pottery, please come to me. I need help. Um, and what we usually find is small shirts that are a bit like this in size, uh, like the ones you see on the slide as well. If they are middle calcolithic, they are usually red on white, so white with red decoration or just red. And on the bottom of the slide, you can see some of our most beautiful ones. And then if it's late calcolithic, then it's finer and thinner, and usually it's red, monochrome, shiny. Um, we have also big storage jars and some closed jars with like usually beige sleep. Um, also, we've been lucky enough to find uh, whole vessels. Uh, over the past few years, we've had really good contexts with big uh, vessels in situ, which means that they are more or less whole and in the position they were left. Uh, and unfortunately, they break when we try to lift them, but we're very methodical about it and we're developing our workflows. So on the slide, you see uh, Rafael Evzonas, who is a conservator, and he worked with a team of students a couple of years ago to restore a lot of these vessels. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what we find. Uh, so what we do first is what we call a macroscopic analysis. So the pottery is being gathered in the field. It comes home to us, we wash it, it dries, and then it comes to me and my helpers. And we do the first level of recording. So we record everything in a database according to what we can see with the naked eye or with a handheld microscope, like the one you can see on the slide. So color, color of the surface, color of the clay, decoration, what we can tell about the shape, those kinds of things. And then a step after that uh, is ceramic petrography, which is essentially um, what we do is that you take a shirt. So for example, this guy here that I'm holding, and then you cut a very small piece. Uh, you polish that piece, you put it with resin to, you glue it on a small glass, there is a whole process, and then you end up with thin sections that are quite small, like this. And these thin sections, you can look under a cross-polarizing microscope. And what you see essentially are is what is in the clay. So the different rocks, the different minerals. Um, so that can help into pinpointing where something was made, according to the geology of the region. Uh, but also it can tell us about uh, firing conditions and temperatures and can tell us about the decoration if it's visible in thin section. It can tell us about the way the vessel was made. If it was made with coiling, you'll be able to tell by the orientation of inclusions and so on and so forth. Um, so within my PhD project, I sampled pottery from four sites, but today we're only going to talk about Palures. Uh, these are the what the shirts I sampled from Palures look like. Uh, in total, they were 23. So most of them were what we call the red-black stroke burnish, which is the first you see on the slide under the data set. Uh, these are usually um, red or pink, orangey, very shiny. You can already distinguish them in the field. They're usually the easiest to recognize. Uh, they're very thin. Sometimes they have some blackened surfaces, like the second picture you see. Um, and they are a late calculated phenomenon, and they're considered to be local to Paphos. Then we also have the spoldware, which is with beige and gray sleep, and it's usually um, closed vessels, small and bigger jars of flasks. 
and it's very hard and you can distinguish it from um, the metal sound, metallic-ish sound it makes. The student, my students will know what I'm talking about. Um, and the white specks that you can see if you cut the shirt to see the clay or on the surface. And then lastly, for the late coccolithic, we also have what we called a red monochrome late coccolithic wear. And these are like thicker, uh, red painted, usually storage jars. Um, and we have not so many in Palures. They occur in almost every late coccolithic uh, context we have, but they're like 10% of the production. So we were thinking that they're coming from somewhere else, and that's the main reason I sampled them. Um, so with ceramic petrography, the idea is that you sample as much as you can strategically, and then you look them under the microscope and you um, put them into groups, what we call fabric groups, which means that these are shirts that have the same characteristics and they belong together. This is from the PhD. I will not bore you with it. Um, they're the different fabric groups. Uh, what we're interested in today are the first four, and I will very briefly walk you through them. So first, we have fabric group one. These are the red-black stroke burnish shirts I talked to you about. And in the pictures, you see how the microscope pictures look like. So these are essentially very hard, hard-fired shirts for prehistoric standards. Um, that are essentially made of a lot of mudstones. It's mostly mudstones, some sandstones. Um, they look like this, and it's only um, red black stroke burnished. Then we have some more red black stroke burnished that are essentially the same thing. So the fabric two is very similar to fabric one but it also has some volcanic inclusions. So gabbro and basalt and some dolerite. So we're, and that's important because maybe these are coming from a different clay source that has more volcanic um, inclusions in it. Then all the spalled wear shirts we have, not only from Paludas, but also the ones I sampled from other sites uh, are made in this uh, fabric group, fabric group three. That is also a lot of mudstones, but also limestone and chert. And then lastly, we have fabric four, which are the not so uh, popular storage jars I talked to you about. And this is completely different. This is uh, full of amphiboles and feldspars and quartz. Um, so this essentially screams through those foothills and not uh, our area in Paphos, so not Thima Lowlands. So why am I telling you this? And it's important, what can it tell us? Um, first, it does confirm that the most popular wares we have during the late Coccolithic, so the red black straw burnish that you see at the bottom and the spoiled wear that you see uh, up are indeed uh, locally produced. Also, the fact that you have two fabrics that correspond to one macroscopic wear and one that corresponds to another uh, shows that they have specific recipes. They have a specific way that they're doing this. Um, and this is important because in the Calcolithic, um, when we're talking about pottery production, we're talking about household production. So they make the pottery themselves at their homes. So this and it has already been argued that in the late Calcolithic, pottery production starts to be more standardized. Um, and this supports this argument. And also, I would like to say that it's the same in Kisonero Australia that is nearby. So it does show that they are very much in contact and they are making the same types of pottery with the same types of clay and the same recipes and the same shapes and so on and so forth. Also, indeed, our uh, late calculated red monochrome or fabric four is not produced in Palures. It is coming from somewhere else. Um, it might 
be coming from the Polis region in northern Paphos. Um, people who excavate there um, and have seen the shirts have said that it looks like their uh, late Coccolithic pottery production. Um, what is also interesting is that uh, on the slide you can see our um, jar that contained the axe that is coming from Anatolia, and we can now see it at the Paphos Museum. And I've sampled um, a shirt that could not fit in the restored uh, vessel, and it fits very well with this group. So it is possible that this jar is coming from there. Um, and then lastly, and not, um, I sampled also from Ambelicuayos Georgios, which is a site in the north. Uh, and it was excavated in the 30s and the 40s, and then the material is stored in Nicosia, the Cyprus Museum. And while looking at the material, there were some shirts that looked like they could be from our region, either from our side or any of the nearby sites that have similar pottery. Um, and indeed, their petrography um, confirms that. So they, they do come from Papos. This is very direct evidence that we have interaction of people and pottery moving from one side to another. Um, so yeah, this was it. Thanks, Maria. It's uh, quite amazing. I always love seeing uh, <laughs> thin sections, of course. <clears throat> and are there any uh, questions from the uh, from the audience? Oh, a whole bunch. I'll start with uh, Maxence. Yeah. I was I was applauding. <laughs> oh, I, thought it was, uh... <laughs> I, I would like to ask. Go uh, right about ahead. Have, have they looked at Yeriskipo because they sell a lot of pottery in Yeriskipo? Yeriskipo. Uh, there is a lot of pottery in Yeroskipu, but not really contemporary to ours, as far as I know. So it's uh, from later periods, I think. So no, I haven't yet. Maybe maybe later, after this PhD is done and I can do more things. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, you have some time, uh, time ahead of you still. Maybe that's a good yeah. uh, postdoc. Uh... Okay, the Hello, that was a very nice uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank uh, you. And very, very, very interesting. Uh, except from the optical uh, under the microscope, of mm -hmm. course, uh, uh, identification of the mm -hmm. minerals, are you able to do also some geochemical analysis on the mineral in order to have uh, a more precise uh, chemical did, signature? I did a handheld XRF analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think we had enough time to present that here. Um, and it it confirms the petrographic observations. Perfect. So mm -hmm. it would be much easier to uh, do the comparison with uh, charts from other uh, sites, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maria, I'm involved with an archaeological dig in uh, the north of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have huge amounts of pottery coming from the site. We don't wash it. Mm. Why is there a difference in the way you handle pottery and the way we handle pottery? Because we're looking for um, analysis of anything that's attached to that, the inside of those pots. Do you not do that? Uh, we do that, but with specific um, pots. So if we have good um, in situ sealed context, then we won't wash the base um, of a vessel, for example, and keep it for that kind of analysis. Um, but yeah, we do that selectively. Because no, no, they're, we they're also... About everything. Also, yeah. So we've got, got 100,000 plus shirts of pottery. Uh, but every single one of them is, is analysed, and uh, uh, we're starting to find lipids and and, and the like, which uh, we we had not expected. That's amazing. But thank you, super talk. Thank you. That that you sounds have... fascinating that you, you you're finding lipids and lipids inside the pots. 
So it's going to tell you a bit more about the diet. Yes, precisely. Milk is milk is being used, uh, but it appears that uh, uh, in the Neolithic where there were probably uh, lactose intolerant, mm. and the only way you can uh, manage milk is by uh, changing it slightly, i.e., heating it. Or well, one of the ways of doing that is heating it. Then they could manage it. Ah. I think Orkney is going to be fascinating to find out. <laughs> Oh, come all the way I, down. I agree with you entirely, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. I can't wait to come back next summer. I was there a few years ago, and I, I, I can't wait to come back. <laughs> okay. Jack, did you have a tiny, very short question before we continue? I had, um, I hope there's time to answer this, but I just wanted to clarify, I guess, um, Maria, you said you found that the, you know, from um, Iosurios, mm -hmm. the Iosurios, yeah. yeah. Um, are you, so how are we able to tell the directionality of the movement of these fabrics and, and vessels? Like, um, is it just you that mean... there are more of the vessels in Paphos, so we know that they're yeah. made there? Or, okay. Yeah, so okay. the geology matches the geology of our region. Okay, so... Um, and it okay. is indeed the most popular production, while in Ambeligu we only have, I think the total numbers were something like 30 Spoldwear shirts and 10 red black stroke burnished, so very few. Okay. Um, and we do have some shirts in Paludas that look like the red lustrus and the red black lustrus of Ambeligu, but there are very few as well. And I, I haven't sampled those to cross check, but I'm, I'm fairly certain they're coming from there. Do you okay. have the content of the, do you have the content of what could have been in these vessels? Ah, well, uh, that's a very nice bridge to our next uh, speaker. Yeah, if indeed. I be so bold. Evie can tell you more about this. Oh, well. I see. So, uh, uh, so sorry for uh, rushing uh, uh, everyone a little bit, but uh, we still have two uh, presentations to go. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Evie Margaritis, who works at the Cypress Institute. Uh, and works on botanical remains since a couple of years, also in our project, which we're very happy with to have her uh, as a, a new team member. Um, uh, take it away. Uh, you can see my PowerPoint, yeah? Absolutely. All right. I don't know how many archaeologists are, are, are in the audience, but uh, I was instructed that uh, the presentation should be for the general public. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to be very specific of the findings. I'm not going to bore you with Latin names because you said that it's for the general public. Okay. So uh, what we do uh, with uh, Kiriaki, Tsitsi, and uh, myself at uh, Palures is that we're trying to see how these people were living in their environment and what were their, their uh, food production and their culinary practices, which are actually, I think, they're relevant questions for what we're doing actually today for uh, people asking these questions for, uh, for uh, uh, the modern society. So we are archaeobotanists, and if we have to define what archaeobotany is, is that it's a subdiscipline of archaeology, which explores the interaction of, of humans and uh, uh, plant remains in the past. So what people, how people were managed their landscapes, what kind of uh, uh, species were uh, you, they were using for, uh, to, for their food and what they were doing, how they were feeding their animals and uh, in, in general, how they're managing their environment. And, and this is, I, I think at least, and I, I hope that, that you agree, this is a, a very, very, a key question for uh, today, for our, our own society now, for a modern society, especially when we have to uh, deal with the climate change that uh, it's a global uh, uh, challenge. Now, the archaeobotanical remains that we are finding, it, they are challenging in the sense that we have to retrieve them. It's not like uh, Victor said in the, in the beginning or 
a blend and uh, Maria talk about uh, figurines, they talk about pottery, that you can actually see uh, these materials at, during the excavation. For the plant remains, we have to retrieve them. And how we retrieve plant remains, and I'll come back to that, is we have seeds, we have wood charcoal, and we have starches that we can find inside the vessels, uh, what people, how people were cooking and what they were cooking. And then we have phytoliths uh, as well, that um, you have to, to imagine that when a plant, uh, some plant species, not all, all of them, decay, they leave their print in the soil. So when we collect this soil and we have specific analysis, we can identify what kind of uh, plants uh, uh, these are. Before I go on, I have to say that Palures is um, the only Halcolithic site in Cyprus that we actually uh, have this interdisciplinary work. And I hope that this is going to change what we know about the period in, uh, in Cyprus and uh, uh, the wider Eastern Mediterranean. So what we do to actually retrieve the seeds from the soil is that we, we, we take sediments from the, from the excavation, from different rooms, different areas that we think that they're interested, interesting. We put them in, um, in a, a, a barrel, as, as you see there, and because they are carbonized, and I'll come back to that, how they're preserved, they float, so we collect them. So this is not a, it's, it's, it's a process, but it's not something that everybody in Cyprus, all the excavation, actually research projects, do that. But Palures, and uh, this is a, a, a very, very good thing, and I have to congratulate the, the directors for that, that they are engaged in this kind of, um, of uh, processes, even though they are time consuming, because we are going to have this extra information that they can actually help us understand what people at Palures were, were, were doing, because archaeology is all about the people. We are interested in what people in the past were doing. So, when we uh, these plant remains are retrieved, they float and we collect them and uh, they dry. And then we, put, uh, we, we take them at the, uh, at the laboratory and we are actually uh, studying them under the, the microscope. And you can see here up at the, at, at the right, uh, charred barley grains or fig grains and olives from the site of Palures, but I'll come back to that. Now, for the preservation that I was telling you, most of the, of the plant remains in Cyprus, I mean, 95% of, of the plant remains in Cyprus and Eastern Mediterranean, they're preserved by carbonization. You have to imagine a house that actually is burnt by fire and destroyed by fire, or when you, uh, people were cooking in, in, in the past, that plant remains, the seeds uh, 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 come in contact with fire and they get uh, carbonized. Of course, you have to not have very high temperatures because then they transform to us and you don't find anything of, um, of, the, of the plant remains. But it is amazing because when they're actually preserved uh, uh, through carbonization, they retain their morphological characteristics and we can identify what kind of plant remains uh, uh, there are. So that's our, 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 our key question. Uh, we have analysis of, of charred wood as well, which are our Panagiotis Kouluros, um, uh, our PhD student, is, uh, is going to, to analyze. And you, you can see that these two, uh, 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 the platanus and the, the plantain and the, and the pine, they have different morphological characteristics. So under the microscope, that you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, di uh, it, it's distinct. So it's, it's like pottery that Maria said, this is red last or so something else. It's exactly like that in, in uh, uh, the morphology is different and we can identify this is barley or this is wheat or this is grape and this is olive. All right, so it, it, it's, uh, it's straightforward. Now, for the, for, for the, for the stats analysis and the phytolith analysis, I'm not going to bore you with that because they're, they're very, very specific uh, information, which, okay, we can, uh, they're only for, for, for specialized archaeologists, I, I suppose. You take soil from uh, the excavations and through, uh, you put them in through chemicals, and then you can actually uh, uh, retrieve starches and, uh, and phytolith. And what this kind of information gives us is that 
what they were cooking, cooking. It's it's so detailed that you can actually see if your lack in the preservation is is, uh, is is good. In what temperatures these people were cooking, so you can actually reconstruct the 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 uh, the, the human act, how how they were cooking uh, their food, and what kind of food they were they were uh, cooking. Which it, uh, I think it's quite a, a amazing actually. So you can you can focus on very very specific actions uh, in uh, in the past. Now, going uh, 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 and focusing on back at Palures and focusing at uh, at Palures, the research questions that uh, Blenda and Victor and uh, Maria has said is that okay, how we can understand the the Chalcolithic uh, society in this region at least or, of Cyprus? And us doing the archaeobotanical work is that how they were managing the land. Do we have uh, plant remains that were actually indigenous in, in, in the area or they were coming from some, somewhere else? What are they were cooking, uh, culinary practices? What they were cooking? What, they, uh, what they, 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 they were using? What the kind of diet they were, they were using? And of course, if they were uh, uh, food networks within Cyprus or in, in the extent in, um, in uh, Eastern Mediterranean as a whole. Now, you have to remember, and this is something that you actually have to, to take back with, the, with you to, tonight, is that uh, 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 farmers and agriculture is a very, very conservative concept. People do not change their, uh, their, uh, uh, how they produce uh, food for millennia. So... When we actually see here, as you see at the slide, these are uh, ethnographic studies that they have they, they are done in different areas of Cyprus around uh, before before the 70s or about around the 70s. And you can see people threshing and winnowing, and then here you can sieve the, the, the cereals and then take off any impurities, and then the cereals are uh, are ready for, for consumption. These are steps that, uh, uh, if you're a certain age, you can remember actually doing or seeing your grandmother or your mother uh, uh, doing. These steps, we can actually identify them in the archaeobotanical record. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is very important because you can zoom in in a micro scale within the settlement, within a house, within a room of how people actually used uh, 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 the, their space and what kind of activities they were actually doing inside the settlement. So at Palures, it's, it, 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 it's very intriguing actually, the, uh, the material, because you expect that what you're going to find is cereal and pulses because people were actually going for food security, okay? They had to, to eat, uh, this uh, that they had to 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 survive. You don't survive on uh, grapes. You don't survive on olives, or you don't survive. Suddenly, you don't survive only or figs or on figs. You use them, but th these are not the central crops that you actually rely on. At Palures, we have a lot of fruit trees, uh, and, and most of them are uh, grapes and figs, which. We have to understand why are they are they doing uh, uh, this? Why do we have this uh, gathering from the wild or exploring the, the the landscape and not actually exploring a, a lot of cereal and pulses cultivation? We have some pulses, we have some cereals, but the majority they are fruit trees, and this is something that we have to understand why the the, the this uh, why they're doing this. Having said that, you have to remember that what is actually preserved in the geobotanical record, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, what they were doing. But in this part of the site, where we have found these things, they were focusing, or this household was focusing on, uh, on uh, fruit trees, trees production. The other very interesting things, which we don't have enough in Cyprus, and I, I, I think this is going to go to be a breakthrough, is that we have these organic lamps that we don't know what they are. And I'm, I'm, I'm calling them organic lamps because they don't have morphological characteristics. So they can be uh, remnants of bread, remnants of fruit, remnants of, broad, of, of processed cereals. 
And this is processed food. And this is not something that you easily find. So we're very, very excited of how we're going to interpret this. And we're going to, uh, to do further uh, analysis. Now, why is this uh, in, in, interesting? Uh, interesting. It's interesting, of course, for us that we're engaged at the Palures uh, uh, excavation, and we want actually to see what was going on in, in Cyprus um, in, in, in prehistory and in the, this specific period. But I think at least that we can be relevant to modern society. People uh, have been uh, dealing with crisis for millennia, and they have reacted to that. And for crisis, I don't mean only uh, wars and climate change, which actually uh, 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 we are dealing with this uh, now, but I, I, I say how, how they, were, they, 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 were, they were reacting to a crop failure. So for if we study closely the past and how people reacted to these uh, uh, shortcomings, we can learn how to react today in this kind of, of situations. Food security was and still is a global uh, challenge around the world uh, today. And this is something that the past can, can, uh, can teach us. For example, uh, ancient Cypriots, and we, we see that at Palures, they have a variety, they cultivate a variety of products, uh, while today we're specializing in very, very specific crops and we have forgotten about everything else. And certainly, this does not lead to food uh, uh, security. So the way that Cypriots in the Chalcolithic period or in the Bronze Age, in prehistory in general, were cultivating the land or how they were managing the land and they could actually reach food security, it's a lesson that can, can actually learn and help us uh, uh, reach sustainability and food security uh, today. In a more, in a more local uh, environment, the, the seeds that we find at Palures can tell us about the culinary practices of the Paphos region. For example, we have found great pips uh, at, uh, at Palures, and we are going to, to, to see if they have affinities with the modern indigenous cultivate, uh, varieties or grape varieties of, uh, of Cyprus and see actually what was uh, uh, if, if, if some varieties go back to, to, uh, to Halcolithic uh, period. Now, what we're doing, we are, we are doing with Kiriaki, as, as I said in the beginning, the archaeobotanical uh, work, but at the Cyprus Institute, we do uh, a variety of, uh, of archaeological science uh, uh, studies. And we, we study archaeological materials uh, like glass pottery, as Maria, Maria was with us for some, uh, for some months last, uh, last year. We do humanist archaeology, say what people, uh, uh, how people were living in, in, in Cyprus, environmental archaeology, which is a part of us, of course, and uh, zooarchaeology of uh, how people actually are managing their animals. Now, because, uh, uh, as I said, uh, we, we want to be relevant to the modern society. We do a lot of outreach activities. So we have, uh, we have created uh, leaflets and uh, uh, stories for young children. We go uh, to schools and we talk about the Mediterranean diet uh, in the past. We talk about food waste. We, we talk about food security. And actually the students the younger students are very, very interested. And we were very, very happy to go actually to Palures and uh, do that at some point in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the spring to go to the, to the local uh, schools and show them what uh, uh, the seats uh, can do. And this is uh, how I finish and thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Evie. It's uh, spectacular to hear. Uh about the, uh, the the processed foods particularly. So uh, it was very interesting. Do you have a hunch what it is? Or, Come again? Uh, do you have a hunch, an idea of what it is? is we, it we, don't, uh, we don't know yet because we have to do a scanning electron microscope, which we are going to do. But uh, we think possibly is processed cereals, something like bulgur, something like trahana. We'll see. <laughs> but we're, we're very, very excited. 
And uh, Kiriaki is going to do the stats analysis as well from inside your vessel. So uh, uh, we can actually see uh, what people were cooking. Uh, amazing. Uh, and of course, next year we will have a cook-off uh, at Palouris, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Miltiades, did you have a question? Yes, uh, that was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, it is correct that you can have several data from uh, archaeobotanics, paleobotanics, uh, regarding not only uh, the human interaction with the climate, but also the climate itself. So. Uh, you can do uh, a paleoenvironmental analysis uh, of the area. And it is very important that uh, Palures have uh, on board uh, the, the team uh, there in the, which they are very capable of doing this thing and hopefully other teams will, uh, will follow. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how about pollen? I didn't see anything about pollen analysis. You do not have pollen at the area? The problem with pollen is that it's not uh, it's not easily preserved. You, you either have to have a lagoon, so a waterlogged environment, or you have to have a, a, a very dry environment, so you can actually uh, have any possibility of, of uh, a pollen to be preserved. The, uh, and of course, for, for for with pollen, even if we had it at at Palouris, it it it's, uh, it it shows it, it it goes towards the environment more and less for the economy because the catchment area of pollen is is very broad, uh, depending on the species as well. But we couldn't be so specific about uh, Palouris. But it's a preservation. That's the that, that that's the problem. Uh, also, something else. Another question: um, Have you seen any uh, direct uh, impact of the sea regarding the plants? Because it is a coastal site; it is very close to the sea, so we have the spray of the sea. Have you identified any type of plants that of the spray of the sea to see that the, that the plants is is very difficult? You can see plants that they are growing in, in wet environments, like or close to, to the sea or close to the uh, to rivers or uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sources of water. But you cannot see uh, uh, if, if, if you have a spray of, of, of the sea. It's, it's not very easy to see that, no. So we cannot identify if it was closer to the sea or further away from no, the no, sea? No, you, you can identify that potentially, uh, especially with the weed seeds, not the cultivated mm -hmm. crops. If you have uh, uh, some seeds, which we have some, but we haven't, uh, we haven't finished our, our analysis, that they are, they are water friendly, then you can you can actually see that okay maybe they were it was closer to the uh, uh, to a water uh, source yes thank you thank you so much you're welcome Asa did you have a question and I was Jack uh, yeah I was curious about um, the kind of unexpectedness of the the figs and grapes um, mm. regarding you know horticulture of fruit trees beyond, you know, kind of food security. Is this something that's kind of unique and new during the Calcolithic? Does this, is this, was this not present in the Neolithic? Um, yeah, just to kind of expand on that. Well, it, it's a big discussion because as, as, as I said, the, what, it, what is preserved, okay, in, 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 at, in, at Palures, let's take uh, Palures and not be like uh, vague, it's, how humans manage or interacted with plants in very, very specific areas. Because you need a medium of fire, okay, to actually, for the plant remains to be preserved. All right. So if you have an area or a part of a building, and of course, we have to discuss that in great detail with the excavators of where these plant remains came from, 
okay? because we have concentrations of cereals and then we have concentrations of fruit trees. Are they different households? Are they different areas? Maybe they are coming from areas that they are open, so they are refuse of food. This is something that we have uh, to deal. One of the of the questions that we're not going to go into details, or if you if you want, we can. The presence of of figs in 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 particular, in combination with specific weed seeds, so not crops, they are connected with dung. So uh, the feces of uh, of of animals. Which in turn they were they were they were used for fuel. So this is something that we have to explore. If in the fires of Palures they were actually using dunk instead of uh, other sources of uh, fuel, which is a a, a very very interesting uh, concept. Thanks, Bleda. A short one. Yeah, short one. Um... Do you have an idea already, Evie, wonderful talk, by the way, of um, is this all wild fruit or is there possibly some form of management or is this something we can only say in a few years from now? No, we, 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 can, we, can, we, we see that for uh, grapes to try and see if they're domesticated or not. We're going to, to, to try and, uh, and do that. For the figs, this is not uh, easy uh, to do. Uh, but even if, if, if they are not, okay, it, it shows a very, very specific interaction of uh, people of Palures with the fruit trees. So this is something that we have to, to take under consideration. Yeah. They were selecting, if, if you know what I mean, very, very specific uh, uh, fruits, either for their own uh, consumption and it's it, it's interesting because I think Kiriaki, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. We have some mineralized uh, seeds. You you are mineralized, yes. Yes, the mineralized seeds means that potentially it can mean that it, it goes through the our intestines and go up. So it's part of feces, okay? And this goes very well with what uh, Victor is going to 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 say next, but. It, 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 it's a choice so yep. yeah why yeah. or not it's a so it's a choice very interesting thanks yeah yeah thanks a lot well on the topic of processed foods i will take it a bit further uh, <laughs> i guess with uh, the final presentation if there's uh, if there's no other pressing uh, questions uh, and of course, after uh, my presentation, there's plenty of uh, time and space as well to uh, continue. So, um, uh, as you could see in the uh, in the invite in the in, in the flyer beforehand, uh, there was one talk that uh, that people uh, were quite excited about. It's all about the poop, because uh, at Palouris we've uh, made some uh, amazing discoveries uh, through time, but. By far, my favorite discovery at Palouris must be the Palouris coprolite, the Palouris poo. And uh, that is why I thought, uh, we thought it would be nice to, uh, to uh, take the time during this symposium to keep you updated on uh, what we are doing with uh, coprolites and, uh, and what's been happening at Palouris. Um, so I have to take you back in time in 2021 we were excavating building 15, and you see it uh, on the photograph here. Um, we didn't find any walls, but we found a floor. Um, let's see if this, uh, ooh, there you go. Uh, the floor indicated in white, and on top of that floor, as it continues uh, underneath uh, a, a lot of uh, rubble, um, is, a, is a large deposit of very ashy soil, full, uh, full of pottery and uh, stone artifacts, uh, wonderful things. And this is the result of the burning down of a building. Now, actually, uh, quite a lot of buildings were burned down in Calcolithic Cyprus, and usually they are interpreted in, uh, in sort of a ceremonial way, that people deliberately set these buildings on fire for some reason, and that they deliberately destroyed some of their or other people's uh, uh, artifacts, their, their, their pots, and these were deliberately uh, destroyed. 
So uh, although we don't know why this happens, and it's an ongoing discussion, um, in my mind at least, there was always some reverence for this context. There's something special going on, and people put some effort into something yeah, that was uh, quite ceremonial and dramatic in nature. Um, the, the context is absolutely beautiful that we excavated very carefully, layer by layer, pot shirt by pot shirt. Uh, we, we excavated this, and here you see some of the jars as they are practically complete still on the floor of this building. And you can see the outlines of all the pot shirts that still uh, uh, are attached to, uh, to each other. So at some point, when I was working in this area, I was scraping away a, a layer of very soft, ashy soil, and my trowel hit something that was slightly harder. And I recognized something um, awkwardly familiar. And there you have it, the Palurus pool, six and a half centimeters of glorious feces. Um, we weren't quite sure in the beginning, because it could have been just a funnily shaped uh, piece of clay, but um, yeah, after looking at it quite uh, carefully in the field, we decided, let's just sample this and see what we can make of it. Maybe it'll turn out to be something uh, interesting. Um, so uh, why, why is it so important? Why is it so amazing to find the Palouras pool? And I have to tell you, the first and almost most important reason is, it's funny. Pool is funny. Uh, we can make lots of jokes and we make them constantly in the field. It is very immature. I'm very sorry if you were expecting something uh, slightly more uh, <laughs> adult here, but uh, there you have it. It is very funny. And I'm sure that many people actually joined this uh, symposium thinking they're going to see something very funny. And it is very popular with all the children that come to the site. It's in, uh, immediately the, 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 the favorite find uh, of everyone. But next to uh, uh, it being funny, there are also some, let's say, scientific uh, aspects to uh, coprolites that are very interesting. As Evi already uh, mentioned, uh, they can contain uh, botanical remains, for instance, that can tell us something about uh, what people are eating. Um, so indeed, um, uh, we can say something about food remains inside, um, but also about health, because uh, these coprolites, they are a direct reflection and direct product of the intestines of an individual uh, 5,000 years ago. So it doesn't really get more intimate uh, than that. And it, in itself, it's sort of a time capsule that captures a lot of little uh, elements of that person's life on that day and that moment. Um, so uh, when, we, uh, when we're exam examining the, the, the sample, a couple of questions immediately popped up that were important for this, uh, for this sample. The first one, is it really a copper light? Are we very sure and how can we prove this? And then of course we want to know, are we sure that it's human or animal? And then there are some questions about the context. Why is it found in between all these shirts? Did someone dig a hole into this uh, context, for instance, and deposited uh, it in there? Or is it actually part of the archaeological uh, deposit? I, there were moments I was afraid we were handling modern dog poo or something, but uh, luckily that's, uh, that's not the case. So to answer the first question, um, yes, it is definitely a coprolite, this sample. And it was quite well visible. Uh, it, it fell apart in a couple of fragments that uh, fit together. And on the section, you can see a, a clear concentric structure of the, of the sample, um, where on the outside, we find the finer grained material and gradually going in, uh, into the center of, the, of this item, it is more coarse grained. And in this particular sample, we even have a very sharp, little, tiny uh, piece of flint lodged right in the middle. So this uh, variation, this graduation of, uh, of, of the, uh, the grain size uh, is actually deliberately done by intestines. So as it passes uh, through the intestines, it is needed and there's uh, uh, stuff added to it to make sure that it passes as easily and comfortably uh, as possible uh, through the intestines. And so this piece of flint did not have uh, the possibility to scratch the, uh, the, the internal wall of, of intestines. So yes, it is definitely um, uh, a coprolite. Um, 
And then to have a closer look at what was actually happening inside and what is the content of this coprolite, we sent it to a lab to be scanned by a CT scanner, a micro CT. And this uses X-rays to uh, obtain a three-dimensional image of the outside, which you see uh, on the right of the screen, um, as well as the inside of the, of the sample without destroying it. Um, and what we see from this fragment is that there is a relatively uh, high amount of uh, sand particles uh, inside, which is a, a bit strange, but uh, it occurs. Um, and uh, also what we notice is we can recognize all sorts of little uh, elements. There are some uh, plant fibers that we can recognize for sure, but also fragments of bone and fragments of shell. And even in this uh, picture here, uh, what is possibly a piece of pottery. Now, this is of course very strange to, to you wouldn't expect this in, in someone's uh, feces, um, but you have to imagine these are absolutely microscopic. That piece of pottery is one of the largest uh, elements that, that, that we find, um, and it's about uh, two millimeters uh, in size. So um, this could easily be part of the scraping of the inside of a pottery uh, jar, for instance. Um, on the whole, uh, this, this, could say, this could tell us that maybe um, uh, this is not a human uh, coprolite, but rather uh, of a pig, but it's definitely not sure. A lot of research has been done on coprolites uh, from prehistory, and uh, ones that they are certain were human uh, can contain all sorts of weird stuff from uh, prehistory. Um, so the next step was to do lipid analysis. Um, th this is an uh, uh, analysis to, uh, to check uh, organic uh, molecule molecules, and we did this. I don't have a picture of uh, any of the graphs, unfortunately, yet. Um, but um, from, uh, from this, we could not get a good result. So from lipid analysis, you can usually pinpoint which animal it was. But for now, we can only say that it was uh, an omnivore, so uh, a pig, dog, or human. Um, uh, the reason that we did not get a good result from uh, those, uh, uh, that study is because the sample is probably heated. So it was heated at least 300 degrees. Um, so uh, after we, it came back from, uh, from the lab, we sent it to yet another lab. And th this is uh, approximately the stage that the sample is in now. We inundated it with clear resin. Uh, and now that it has just been hardened, we're going to cut it and create a thin section, just as Maria showed of her pottery. And a thin section of this coprolite um, hopefully will yield more information about the microscopic elements that are inside this coprolite fragment. Um, so I, I don't have a, uh, the results of that yet for this, uh, this coprolite, but I can show you um, a thin section uh, that also contains some coprolytic material. Because at Palurus, we've taken a lot of soil samples that we also uh, treated in the same way for thin section analysis. And in this particular one, this, uh, the thin section is about 10, 12 centimeters uh, uh, large. Um, if we zoom in, we can see that there's a sort of a yellowish blob in the middle uh, here. And if we zoom in even more, um, it is clear that this is organic material, highly phosphatic. And so it is uh, probable that this is uh, also um, a coprolite material in the soil mixed in. And those uh, little ovals that you can see are very probably uh, uh, the eggs of parasites. So um, uh, the particular uh, eggs that have been uh, recognized are probably uh, blastocystis, which is a single-celled organism that is not too bad. Um, but we also have uh, the eggs of either Ascaris, or I should say a whipworm, or pinworm. Um, I can tell you that uh, investigating these things uh, is, no, uh, is no pleasant endeavor. It's quite nauseating to uh, go through all the, <laughs> the, the shapes and sizes of the, the horrible an animals that can live uh, uh, within us. Um, and the statistics are also not particularly pleasant. So. Um, Although we could say that uh, we see that these um, parasites occur uh, very frequently, relatively frequently in prehistory and not very frequently in modern times, um, pinworm occurs in about 5% of people, even in industrialized countries like the ones we live in. Um, 
it means that uh, probably one or two people in the audience are suffering uh, from this without knowing it. So, um, uh, so just not to judge the calculistic uh, uh, people uh, too much. Pinworm is um, particular to humans. Um, so uh, we need a specialist to define uh, with more clarity which one uh, we are dealing with exactly. Um, but if it is pinworm, then it means that it's definitely human feces that we have here. So um, uh, we're hoping to get that from the uh, copper light sample as well, the, the larger one. So the other question was, why did we find uh, this copper light in this building? This burnt building, which we always interpret as this sort of special, ceremonial, weird event that we don't understand. Why is there a pool in there? Well, from the Libet analysis, um, it's, uh, we know that actually this copper light was burnt. And this tells us that uh, rather than uh, a modern dog digging a hole in our archaeological uh, uh, deposit and depositing something of himself there, um, this is definitely a calcolithic copper light, so definitely 5,000 years old. And it was inside this building when it burned down. Um, so uh, uh, that tells us that it, it kind of belongs there in some way. But why we didn't quite understand and still is quite difficult. So we, uh, uh, as we were excavating in the last summer, 2023, we were excavating again a burnt building. This is a, a different burnt building, but we find so many of them. On the left, you see uh, uh, Leon uh, squatting next to uh, lots of pottery that was found inside. So again, we're dealing with one of these weird buildings burned down with all sorts of uh, uh, pottery inside. Um, and then, uh, apart from uh, next to all the artifacts, she made the discovery of a lifetime. You've guessed it. It is another Palurus pool. So uh, here we are very proudly looking at, uh, uh, at, at the sample, which is uh, really inside this ashy uh, deposit again. It is very similar in morphology uh, and in size. And um, it, it looks like by, the, by its structure that it is also burnt. So it's really part of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, this context. And suddenly it's a pattern. We finding, we're finding these in, uh, in burnt context. Um, and not much later, uh, I think it was the, the, the same day, or the same week, in BI-21, a different uh, trench, uh, just a very close by, um, they were excavating a pit filled with ashes, and lo and behold, uh, we are continuing. Uh, these are Andreas and Sergio, uh, they were quite proud, you don't see it, but they were quite happy to find uh, their own sample as well. But it didn't end. In their uh, pit, where we also found uh, some copper objects that were, uh, that were very special, um, it just kept on coming. It was like uh, treasure hunting for uh, special people. Um, another fantastic sample, uh, again in, in little portions, same size, same morphology, also probably burnt, and from the same ashy context. You think that was it? Think again. Deeper into the pit, they kept on coming, all sorts of individual pits. And to make sure that you uh, don't think that I'm the only one who likes these uh, finds, this is Sven, one of the students who is absolutely thrilled with his copper light. Well, not his, but well, yeah, you, you, get, uh, you get the point. Um, so uh, it just keeps on, uh, they, they just keep on appearing now. And this is, uh, uh, and, and this is quite, uh, uh, spectacular because until the first Palurus pool, we didn't have a single one from prehistoric context, as far as I can uh, find out, in Cyprus. So maybe we just have a nose for this, or we uh, or we excavating the right context. But yeah, there is uh, uh, something going on. Um, so uh, if we look at the overview of the site. Uh, the current distribution, the spatial distribution of our samples is divided kind of in two. On the lower plot, uh, I just showed you uh, the, the bird context, we find these wonderful uh, copper lights. And on the upper plot, we have at least three spots where in the soil samples we're finding these um, uh, wonderful pieces of uh, fecal matter in the soil kind of mixed in. Um, so. 
um, the reason that we have this division is, is not because uh, they were uh, um, sort of defecating in the lower plot and throwing their toilet paper in the upper plot, uh, but this has likely something to do with sampling. So in the lower plot, we've been uh, working more in uh, burnt buildings, especially uh, recently. And the upper plot, we sampled way more uh, uh, for soil. So that's why we have this uh, difference uh, right now. Um, and what it tells us, I think, is actually not there's a division, but it tells us that um, these feces are present everywhere uh, in the site, in the soil and in the buildings. Um, and how they were exactly deposited, we're not 100% sure yet. Um, we did not find toilets or cesspits or such that people often think uh, that this must uh, represent. Um, prehistoric toilets and, and sort of uh, and cesspits are known and they contain way more uh, samples than, than just the, the few that uh, we are finding. So th these are a little bit, little bit random and it could tell us that maybe uh, people used any, let's say, empty structure or any pit they could find to use as a toilet. Um, or we just happen to be finding the few that are preserved because they were burned. Now, and these are questions that we are, uh, uh, that we uh, still have to answer. Why are they really there? Uh, but uh, the patterns are coming, uh, coming out. Um, and the new samples that we found this year, of course, are also going to be scanned for, uh, uh, by CT. And we're going to see if, please, we can get some uh, lipid uh, signals from these, uh, from these samples. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, pray that we find some more uh, details, such as, uh, well, either burning marks or little squiggly worms that uh, were living in calcolithic uh, people. Um, so uh, in the upcoming year, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, new information that will come out probably about, uh, uh, about all these uh, wonderful samples. Um, if you are very uh, interested in this, then I would uh, suggest that you become a friend of Palouris, because of course uh, uh, I've told you about our foundation. Our friends, they get always the, uh, all the latest information uh, uh, the quickest, especially during the excavation, detailed newsletters about what's happening at the site. Um, so it's very, uh, very exciting to be a member of that. And we'll paste uh, uh, the information about uh, how to become a member and all that uh, in the in the chat. Um, um, and um, uh, of course, uh, I want to remind you quickly of our uh, site and the socials that are also paste in the in the chat. If you have any questions about uh, the Palouris Poo, then I'll be very happy to uh, to answer it. And uh, other than that, I uh, uh, open the floor for any general questions too. Uh, hi, <laughs> thank you for that. Like, thank you to everyone. I mean, these were super fun to listen to. Um, <laughs> and you're right, it is very silly and exciting to learn about poop. Excited to hear what the results will be. Uh, I just wanted to ask, we said it could be an omnivore, um, and you only mentioned dog and human. Have we ruled out pig no, as well was, as uh, an option? I think I mentioned pig. Yeah, no, pig is also possible. Okay, pig, pig as well. Okay, okay. Just wondering, maybe there was a reason why it was not pig, based on, like, the shape of the intestines, you know, the way it moves. <laughs> no, so uh, apparently... Um, it, it, there is no strict uh, morphological typology for uh, for poos of, uh, of omnivores, uh, at least at, at least human dog and uh, and pig. You cannot uh, really say on the basis only of the morphology where it came from. And you'd be surprised if you go to York. There's uh, the Jorvik Museum uh, where they have a Viking poo on display, which if you see it, uh, you would think it's an elephant uh, product. So it really, it's uh, they go all over the place, and they're uh, yeah. Any other questions about uh, about our favorite find? Uh, it must have been incredibly clear. Deafening silence. I know. Uh, yeah. Ah, Maxals, <laughs> we. I was wondering, do you think one of the reasons that we find so much is uh, also mainly that we are aware of their presence in a way that 
Yeah, we... absolutely. Yeah, so, so one of the things I, I, I've seen a lot of these uh, uh, things in, in other contexts before, especially in the literature um, through my work in micromorphology, because yeah, it's, an, it's a hot topic there. Um, so I think that's why I was, I kind of thought, hey, I, I wanted to take it serious as a, with the first find. And um, yeah, we've been pestering everyone at the site so much about how great it is to find a pool. Uh, that yeah, the people were looking out for it, and before you know it, uh, we're finding them left, right, and center. So yeah, it's possible that we missed uh, a bunch before in in other uh, contexts. But, yeah. yeah, and probably they they would have found others in other sites as well, but they maybe. Yeah, yeah no, that's something still to uh, uh, yeah to to check, but uh, it's. Uh, it's especially in these burnt contexts that we uh, find them. I and mean, you don't have so many of these burnt contexts usually at, uh, at sites. So uh, maybe we're also very lucky. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you expect also to find seeds and things like that in, in poo, even if it's burnt? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you, if you want to say something. But in, in this fragment, for instance, we, we, we do, uh, you can find them and they, they can be charred. But it, uh, we didn't see any charred remains on the coprolite itself, um, and it's completely desiccated. So um, what we can find in the CT scans, for instance, is uh, the original shape as voids inside the, uh, the coprolite. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, Effie? Uh, you can do, uh, and we are going to do. You can do phytolith analysis. What yeah. they have done in 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 in, in uh, other uh, situations, which we have to 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 be very clear about it. There are not many. In Eastern Mediterranean, I think that uh, they have found a Chatal Huyuk, and that's about it. So uh, we are uh, the 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 ones holding the <laughs> uh, the coprolite. Yeah. Uh, you can you you can do CT micro CT so you can see inside because sometimes th there are microfauna that uh, small uh, uh, bones that uh, and the the micro CT they can actually uh, tell you where to sample for for further analysis but the phytolith analysis is going to tell us a lot uh, about uh, the, the the diet so that's that's going to be something very very significant. Talking yeah. about the diet, do you know how long that they would breastfeed their infants for? I don't know how long it takes no. nowadays. <laughs> I, I don't think you can you can you can say that. Uh, th there are unless you can find the, 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 the skeleton of children or, or of something that can tell you what would change in their diet because we know that in third world countries it would be normal to feed up to five years of age and and i obviously this is my speciality and and i'm interested to see in prehistoric times how long the human would breastfeed their infant we do have uh, technologies to investigate that but then you have to look at the teeth of children um, and there are ways of actually seeing from the, the enamel layers in the teeth uh, at what age weaning occurs. But uh, that's not something we have done so far. But I know of colleagues who have, who have done that successfully. I would be very interested to hear, being as that is my 40. For the future. Yeah, definitely. We have about 15 uh, skeletons from the, from the site. Uh, many children, um, but uh, uh, not particularly well preserved uh, for, for, for these purposes, uh, I think. But, uh... Well, in particular, because I know nowadays there is not this breastfeeding culture and how important it is to humans. If I, I would, before I forget, um, we uh, um, uh, we wanted to ask some questions to the audience in a in a short survey. 
uh, just to see about what people uh, uh, like and don't like and where they're from. And because we see a lot of new names that we haven't seen uh, before and we're very interested to know kind of where people are from and, and, and yeah, uh, how we can cater to people's needs more with our projects uh, in our outreach uh, attempts. Um, so I've pasted it in the chat, the, the link for the survey, but I'll also send another email to everyone who registered. Um, and if you could take the time, it, there are six questions or so, so it's really like uh, less than a minute probably to fill in. That would be, uh, that would be amazing. So um, um, yeah, and see what else we can organize for people. Sorry, Bleda. Uh, there's nothing in the chat yet. Oh, no. Ah, wait. Sorry. Uh, no, no. No? Ah, sorry. Everyone in meeting. I'm sending it only to uh, Nora. Sorry, Nora. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, the links are there. Not the others. There's a question about poo. I, I, uh, Always there are questions about poo. <laughs> uh, as far as, as uh, I can understand, you do not have any preserved organic material into the poo because they were burned, right? Yeah. So you do not have any uh, uh, methodology that you can use to date them. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, if, if there was a chart seat in there or so, then maybe uh, uh, we could, but uh, there's no, um, let's say, the, 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 the plasma of the, of the coprolite is uh, no longer. Interesting to know how long people okay. breastfed. Interested to know how long people breastfed. Sorry, wait, was it a question? Uh, Interested to know how long people breastfed. I think something went wrong there. Uh, sorry, Matthias. Uh, yes, was that an answer to your question? Uh, yes, yes, maybe there are some ways that you can uh, try to to work with geochronology studies in order to to date uh, i don't know what material you have found inside you talked about sun so maybe you have some quartz or some uh, k feldspars uh, into that uh, uh, poop, maybe you can do something like an OSL analysis uh, or use a different methodology uh, to, to date this, uh, this yeah. sample. So the, so the good thing is that it's, the context is very secure and we, uh, and, and we can date the context relatively good. Uh, although we don't have too many chart sheets and such for, uh, from there, um, because it was burned uh, together, it's likely, and, and it is found really in between the pot shirts itself, inside the ashy soil, it's very likely that it was relatively fresh when it uh, uh, arrived in the building. So uh, th th there's one, uh, th the only question is kind of, how, yeah, how, what, what is the, 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 the gap of time between the deposition of the, the, the poo and the, the, the 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 fire um and whether it was brought in it is also possible for instance that um people brought fuel into the into the building uh dried grasses and such that someone had just used as a as a toilet and that it kind of came in with that and, and that it was uh, burned because of that but uh, yeah, we, so we have a lot of options still open to, to see kind of what is exactly the relationship between the two, but they are very close, uh, closely related. So in terms of dating it, uh, there, there won't be, I, I, I wouldn't expect even a year to be between the production and the deposition of the final deposition of the, the pool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. Yeah, yeah no worries. No worries. Anyone else? 
So uh, if you're uh, if you're not yet uh, friends with Paluris, I'm uh, uh, I'm gonna just I'm trying to plug it uh, everywhere. Then uh, uh, I, I the the link is now actually in the chat, so uh, you can uh, find uh, uh, your way to our site and uh, see if you want to be constantly updated and pestered uh, pestered by us. Well. Okay, well, everyone's very quiet. It's uh, thunderously uh, quiet here. Let me uh, uh, at least thank uh, all the speakers from Bleda, Maria, and uh, Evi, and also Kiriaki for, uh, uh, for helping out making this uh, a great success. I hope everyone enjoyed themselves thoroughly. I hope so. Thank okay. you very much, Victor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. Nice to see all the students. I see a lot of, yeah, um, <laughs> people are laughing immediately. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, well, um, if, uh, if no one has any questions or any, uh, anything to chat, uh, feel free to throw open your uh, microphone and say hi or, uh, or goodbye. And then uh, I guess well, we can call it a night. There's one raised hand. Oh, um, Michael. There's one raised hand, yeah. Hey man, bring it on. Hi there. Yeah, sorry. I thought it was just still on copper lights, but I had a general question actually about ah. it, um, which I think was uh, on. Uh, thanks for all the talks anyway. It was very interesting. Um, but I was wondering during the talk on the vessels and then also on uh, the finds on um, uh, the foodstuffs and all, like, um, what I was wondering, because there were some vessels that were clearly not from the site itself, but they were probably brought in from another place. That I was wondering what was in there and why was it brought over there. It seems that there must have been some sort of imports and exporting happening there. And that made me wonder, like, of course that would be there. And then some people would have an abundance of some stuffs like grains or like them figs that you got over there. Um, but the most important, like, interesting thing to me would be then, like, what would be the thing you could trade with? And would that be a figurine or, well, well, probably not poo, but I'm trying to like link them all together here. But yeah, so this import export thing was like sort of to my interest. I just didn't know who to ask it to. So maybe Victor could direct yeah. it to someone. Yeah. <laughs> the boss. Yeah, the big boss, man. This is uh, this is indeed a very good question, and uh, it is uh, certainly something we would like to 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 do in future years to try and see if we can find, for example, residues in these vessels of some sort. Um, it's it's not easy in most cases, but it's 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 worth a shot. Um, I would be very happy to find wine if we can find it. Uh, it has been found in uh, in calculated vessels before. So uh, that's a possibility for sure. Uh, so the tartaric acid has been uh, found, um, and so yeah, that's that's another thing we would like to explore in uh, in the coming years. But it hasn't been done yet for our site. Okay, I, I get that. But also, of course, per region, you would know what will be uh, local to the region, right? Like wine or or, or barley or figs or stuff. And is that um that could be easily connected to the certain vessels coming from like the number of vessels coming from one region or the other right like i would have a lot of vessels from the wine region and just a few of the like i don't know the boring ones <laughs> does that make sense or it makes sense if, yeah. if, if, I, can, if I can answer then maria i'm sure that he ha she has a, a, a more to say it, it it doesn't mean that because we have vessels from uh, other regions of cyprus that they come with the product we can have vessels coming from other other sites that they don't come with products, but they come as as as, uh, as vessels. Uh, it, it's not very easy. Uh, apart, I mean, if you have distinct geographical uh, regions in Cyprus, which we don't have that. Okay, barley, for example, only has uh, uh, grown in like in the north of Cyprus. And then we know that this has come from uh, from there. That's that's not the case. One analysis that somebody can do to see if uh, food was brought in the in the in the uh, in the site is uh, strontium analysis, isotope uh, uh, strontium analysis. And there 
you can get geographical regions where the, the, the products are coming from. Having said that, this is a very dodgy uh, uh, situation in Cyprus because you don't have distinct geological uh, areas in Cyprus that they can actually give very different isotopic uh, signature. So this is very, very, very uh, uh, difficult to actually say if the pot comes with, the vessel comes with the food or it comes uh, as, it, as it is and then you, you store food of a local production uh, there. And this is a question not only for Palures, but, uh, but a, a general one for, for, for many, many uh, sites. Super interesting. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> I was saying, as friend of Palouris, you can also, of course, uh, pop by and uh, investigate these things uh, yourself during the excavation season. Well, no, not interested. <laughs> um, hello, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, we can. Hi, Nora. Hi, everyone. I couldn't see how to put my hand up. I was actually away out in the mountains, so I was in and out of the connection. I'm hoping it might be possible to listen back in some way, either on YouTube or some yeah. way at some point. Yeah, it will be. We'll, uh, we'll post the whole thing on, on YouTube. Make sure. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Because I know a few of us in the pot washing group here from P3A Archaeology would have loved to attend fully. We were at different gatherings, uh, but I got messages from many. We were just so delighted to be invited and to get such insights. Uh, but the food, all these interesting aspects that we're just aware of from the outside looking in, but we're so delighted to be able to participate with you all and your students when you're here in the summers. So it's such a joy to get all these insights from uh, yourselves. I possibly should have put on my video, but I'm not, on, oh, there it is. I'm not on my usual device, so I'm not familiar with all how it works now. But Dr. Blade, Dr. Victor, and you all, uh, Dr. Eve, uh, all that information and insights, thank you so, so much not just from me, but from my P3A archaeology uh, group. Well, I'm very glad you, uh, you enjoyed it uh, so much. It's great to have you guys over all the time at the site uh, as well to help pot washing. It's always, uh, it's always really good uh, to have uh, such interest from, uh, from everyone around in the, in the neighborhood. Absolutely. It's lovely to have this connection with you all yeah. and collaboration. Thank you once again. Great. You'll see me again in, uh, I think, in February when there's a talk planned yes. in, in Paphos. Oh, well, so uh, uh, yes, I hope I won't uh, repeat myself too much. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I wasn't going to mention it just on the air, but I knew it was half planned. So I'm delighted that you've mentioned it also. So we'll yeah. be in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we're going to post it on uh, YouTube, I believe. Yeah, very good. So that we can share it uh, that way with uh, other people that couldn't attend today. Perfect. And um, I think that uh, everybody's getting a bit tired, Victor. So yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> call it the night. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to see if I can uh, say goodnight uh, to people individually. I see Jan is uh, constantly uh, smiling. Uh, uh, at us, but never, never saying anything. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> with that, uh, thank you all very much. I guess we can close and, uh, and go to bed, uh, dreaming of uh, Palouris, as uh, as we do uh, every night. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Nice bye -bye. to see you. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>